you, Mark. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I gather uh, you all had an opportunity to review uh, my report, which was submitted to the uh, Prime Minister a few days ago. I am pleased to be here this morning to discuss it with you. I intend to make some uh, brief comments by way of overview, and then would be happy to answer any questions um, that you may have. Uh, the report details the results of eight months of engagement with First Nations communities in Alberta and British Columbia, and with representatives from industry, uh, the two provincial governments, and local governments. Uh, I want to, um, uh, this morning, uh, to acknowledge the able assistance I, I received um, uh, from three people who are here, Ruby Porter, Amanda Rollison, and Ben Claremont. And I also want to express my gratitude to the many Aboriginal communities I visited in Alberta and British Columbia. Um, I, I can say that I was always warmly received um, where I went, and um, uh, the dialogue that we engaged in was um, uh, both constructive um, and respectful. Um, I was provided a specific mandate. Uh, the mandate is set out on page 46 of the report. I think everyone here has a copy of the report. I would be happy to talk about the elements of the mandate um, if anybody has any questions about it. While I heard um, several comments during the course of my engagement, uh, there are four key observations uh, that um, I have been able to um, uh, gather as a result of um, my meetings with uh, Aboriginal communities industry <coughs> and the two provincial governments. The first is that Canada and Aboriginal commu communities need to build effective relationships, and in my view this is best achieved through sustained engagement. Uh, secondly, that Aboriginal communities view natural resource developments as linked to a broader agenda of reconciliation. Uh, thirdly, Aboriginal communities uh, will consider supporting natural resource development only if those developments are undertaken in an environmentally uh, sustainable manner. And uh, finally, that First Nations communities expect to be involved in the process of planning and decision making uh, for projects in their traditional territories. These observations um, form, inform the narrative and recommendations under three broad headings in the report. Uh, the first heading is building trust, uh, the second fostering inclusion, and the third um, advancing reconciliation. Uh, based on um, my discuss discussions over the past eight months, I believe uh, there's a strong interest and a real opportunity for Canada and First Nations communities to more effectively collaborate and address their respective interests. I think it's also true that there are high expectations that governments and First Nations communities will embrace the opportunities offered by energy developments in Alberta and British Columbia. It's clear, however, that progress will only occur if the constitutionally protected rights of Aboriginal Canadians are taken into account in project development. I hope uh, that my report will provide a useful starting point uh, for the parties uh, the fourth section of the report, which is um, entitled Taking Action, provides what I hope will be construed as practical steps and concrete action for moving uh, the Crown First Nations agenda forward. Now, those are my comments by way of overview, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Okay, so uh, just by way of announce your because we have people listening in, please just announce your name, media outlet, and keep it to one question and one follow-up because there's lots of people here. Okay. Uh, you ready? Okay. Oh, You're sorry. too polite. There's no Go mic. ahead. Okay. Yeah. There isn't a mic? There's, uh, <coughs> there's no mic. Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to be clear. Is it Eifert or Aford? Aford. Aford. Uh, Mr. Aford, I, I do have a number of questions. The first one that occurs to me just chronologi chronologically in your report is uh, you make a statement where you say your discussions have not been part of Crown consultation for any of the projects. Do I take that to mean then that nothing that you've done over these past eight months could at some point be introduced in any kind of legal claim or legal uh, battle over any of these projects to indicate that the federal government has indeed consulted with First Nations? Correct. Um, on the issue of consultation, you talk about how some of that has been delegated uh, to propo project proponents. And I, I wonder if I could ask you just to speak a little bit more at length about 
what you found uh, in, in terms of how that might have been deficient, or particularly with the projects we're seeing right now, um, Northern Gateway and Kinder Morgan's uh, proposed projects? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's a, um, a fact of life in Canada today that um, industry is part of the consultation process. Um, I found, uh, first of all, that industry um, certainly understands the need for that process to be uh, completed in a manner that's satisfactory to First Nations communities because uh, they understand that uh, First Nations communities have the legal right to delay or prevent projects uh, from proceeding. The deficiencies in the process that um, I've identified in my report uh, relate to the fact that uh, the Government of Canada um, um, uh, conducts its consultation and regulatory processes. Now, the a GRP process for the Northern Gateway project is an example of how Canada uh, discharges its legal duty. And my, my view and the recommendation I've made is that there's an opportunity for governments um, uh, to engage uh, either through formal consultations or otherwise uh, through a process of relationship building with First Nations communities outside of consultation processes. And that's, um, I think, sort of the center point of the recommendations 